ओम नमः भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय सो आई वाज गिवन एन इंस्ट्रक्शन अबाउट एन आवर अगो दैट द फॉर्मेट फॉर आवर Krishna Leela will be different than the format we use for Bhagavad Gita. So I agreed to what Sri Lesh said. So it will be extemporaneous uh speaking mostly and we will begin with this 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. As we learned in the Bhagavad Gita chapter 4 Janma karma cha me divyam evang yo veti tatvatah tyakva dehaṁ punar janma naiti māmeti sarjuna Krishna said in that verse that if you understand exactly scientifically in truth the nature of his appearance and his activities then this is your last material birth at the end you will return to krishna's abode and join him in his leela so in this 10th canto of srimad bhagavatam is where we hear the narration of krishna's janma and karma his birth and his activities Krishna's pastimes are performed in three dhams Mathura dham Vrindavan dham and Dwaraka dham The leela begins in Mathura then goes to Vrindavan then comes back to Mathura and then the remainder is in Dwaraka So since we are studying Srimad Bhagavatam I want to just give you this preliminary verse to understand something about what is Srimad Bhagavatam We learned in our studies of the introduction to Bhagavad Gita the last 3 weeks Bhagavad Gita had five subject matters Ishwara God jiva the living entity kala eternal time prakriti material nature and karma activities but in the srimad bhagavatam there are 10 subject matters atar sargo visargascha stanam poshanam utaya manvantare shanukata nirodho muktir asraya दशमस्या विशुद्ध्यर्थं नवानं इह लक्षणं वर्णयन्ति महात्मना सुतेनार्थेन चांजसा सो व्हाट आर द टेन सब्जेक्ट मैटर्स ऑफ श्रीमद् भागवतम नंबर 1 द क्रिएशन ऑफ द इंग्रेडिएंट्स ऑफ द कॉस्मोस 2 द क्रिएशंस ऑफ लॉर्ड ब्रह्मा 3 द मेंटेनेंस ऑफ द क्रिएशन Number 4 special favor given to the faithful Number 5 impetuses for activity 6 prescribed duties for law abiding men 7 a description of the incarnations of the lord 8 the winding up of the material creation Number 9 liberation from both gross and subtle material existence and number 10 the ultimate shelter the supreme personality of godhead so what will we doing for the next few years is giving you a shrimad bhagavatam sar the essence of the 10th canto which prabhupad calls the samam bonam the word samam bonam means the ultimate good so that is 
what is there in the 10th canto. And what is this 10th canto? Krishna's janma and karma, his birth and his activities. Now, before Sukadeva Goswami begins to explain Krishna Leela, Maharaj Parikshit gives us his understanding of what he has learned so far in nine cantos. So he says that who will appreciate Krishna Leela? Not everybody will appreciate Krishna Leela. The person who will appreciate Krishna Leela is described by the word Nivritta Tarshire, meaning one has lost the taste for material sense enjoyment. To the degree that you have lost your thirst for material enjoyment, then to that degree you will be able to relish this 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. So the 10th canto begins with a prelude. The scene opens, Mother Earth is crying, and Mother Earth approaches Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma is the most intelligent individual in the universe. That's why he is Lord Brahma, most qualified and most intelligent. So Mother Earth approaches Lord Brahma, but she assumes the form of a cow. And when she goes to Lord Brahma, she has tears in her eyes. And she explains to Lord Brahma that she is feeling very much overburdened. Why is she overburdened? Because Kamsa has created an alliance of demons. Kamsa has defeated all the demons in the universe. He has defeated the demigods, including Indra. Kamsa has established himself as the most powerful king throughout all the three worlds. Yes, he even defeated in Indra Deva and all the other demons on the earth. He also defeated them one by one by one. So all of them accepted Kamsa as their leader. So Kamsa wanted to rule the earth by his demoniac uh, plans. So Mother Earth was feeling this is too much because what else did Kamsa do? What did Kamsa do? He made a military industrial complex. He was unnecessarily increasing the military might of all the demons. So Mother Earth was very much distressed. So she went to Lord Brahma, please, can you relieve my distress? Can you do something? I'm feeling too burdened. For Lord Brahma, the situation was over his head. He was not able to relieve Mother Earth's burden. So Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, Mother Earth, and all the demigods went to the shore of the ocean of milk. In this universe, according to the Bhagavatam, there are different kinds of oceans. Here on planet Earth, we have an oceans of salt water. But in other regions of the universe, there is an ocean of liquor, an ocean of ghee, an ocean of salt water. So there's seven types of oceans and one is the ocean of milk. And why did they go there? Because the ocean of milk is the residence of Shweta Dweep, the white island. And on that white island is the residence of Kshirodakashai Vishnu. Kshirodakashai Vishnu is actually Krishna in your heart. 
in your heart as super soul is not exactly Krishna himself in his original form, but it is an expansion of this Shiro Dakashayi Vishnu. Shiro Dakashayi Vishnu is the maintainer of the universe, just as it is said that Lord Brahma is the engineer of the universe and Lord Shiva is the annihilator and destroyer of the cosmic manifestation. But the hardest job is to maintain and that is accepted by Lord Vishnu or in this case, Kshiro Dakashai Vishnu. So it is standard practice that whenever the demigods are too much harassed by the demons or when they have no way to mitigate their sufferings, they go to the shore of the ocean of milk and they worship Shiro Dakashai Vishnu by reciting a prayer known as the Purusha Sukta. In many temples of South India, they recite that Purusha Sukta prayer very powerful mantras in that prayer. So, Shiro Dakashai Vishnu is not visible to the demigods or Lord Brahma, but they go to the shore of the ocean of milk and offer their prayers. Then, Lord Brahma sits down in meditation, and Lord Brahma receives what I call a text message from Krishna in the heart. And what is that text message? That text message is, yes, I am coming, but I'm not coming as Shiro Dakashai Vishnu. No, I am coming in my original form as Krishna himself. I will be coming in my human form, my original form. Krishna has many forms. He has the four-armed form, Narayan, Vishnu. But Krishna, in his Goloka Vrindavan, is two-armed, human-like form. So the message from Shiro Dakashai Vishnu is that all the demigods should expand themselves. Just see, the demigods are able to expand themselves. Wouldn't you like to be able to expand yourself? You could expand yourself. One of you could go to work and the other of you stays home and enjoys. But as human beings, we don't have that potency. But the demigods have that potency. They are able to expand themselves. So Shiroka Dakshai Vishnu told Lord Brahma that all the demigods should expand themselves and take birth in a certain family known as the Yadu Vangsha. The Yadu Vangsha comes down in the dynasty of Soma, the moon god. So the Yadu dynasty is part of the Soma Vangsha. Just as Lord Ramachandra, he appeared in the Surya Vangsha or the Sun dynasty. His forefathers come down from that Sun dynasty. Krishna appears in the Soma or Moon Dynasty. So all the demigods are to take birth in this Yadu Dynasty. Why? In order to assist Krishna now that he is going to come. We learned in Bhagavad Gita why Krishna comes. He comes for several reasons. Krishna comes whenever there is a discrepancy in the regulations of religion, whenever the rules of religion are disturbed, Krishna comes. He comes to reestablish the principles of religion. And also Krishna comes to uh, do away with irreligion. And then Krishna comes to give solace to the devotees, in this case, the demigods and Mother Earth, because they are devotees. And Krishna comes to annihilate the demons. So the, we learned this in chapter four of Bhagavad Gita. 
These are the reasons why Krishna descends as an avatar. Avatar means one who comes down from the higher realm, from the spiritual realm, down to the material plane. That is known as avatar. So the demigods were informed by Lord Brahma that they were to expand themselves and immediately take birth in the Yadu dynasty in order to assist Krishna. Because that is what a demigod is. A demigod is not a competitor to Krishna. Doesn't matter. Brahma, Shiva, Indra, Surya, Soma, any demigod. They're not Krishna's competitor. They are Krishna's servant. So since Krishna was going to come in his original form, all the demigods, they are meant to assist Krishna in different capacities. So that's scene one. Now scene two is called the omen. Now Shukadeva Goswami tells Maharaj Parikshit that there was a wedding between Vasudev and Devaki. And Vasudev and Devaki have just been married. And so Vasudev is now taking his new bride and he's going to bring her to his home, which is in Mathura. And riding the chariot, driving the chariot, is Devaki's, not exactly brother, but like a cousin brother. And his name is Kangsa, which I already mentioned, the most powerful demon in the universe. He has conquered all the other demons. So as a matter of affection for his sister Devaki, Kamsa is driving the chariot Vasudev and Devaki are seated on the chariot and there's a procession and there is instruments and elephants. It's a grand procession. Then all of a sudden, Kamsa hears a voice in the sky. Kamsa, you fool. The eighth child of your sister will kill you. When Kamsa hears this, with one hand, he lets go of the horses, the reins of the horses. And with that hand, he grabs Devaki by the hair. And with his other hand, he pulls out his sword. And he is going to now cut off the head of his sister. That is a demon. A demon is someone who only thinks of his own sense gratification. If anyone interferes with his sense gratification, be it <coughs> the father, sister, brother, no. A demon will even kill one's beloved brother or sister or father if it interferes with sense gratification. So because Kamsa has heard this omen in the sky, he's about to kill Devaki. So Vasudev, very, very intelligent, starts to preach to Kamsa and tries to convince Kamsa that it is not in his best interest to kill Devaki at this time. Vasudev gave Lots of reasons why it is not a good idea to kill Devaki. Vasudeva is thinking, I have to do something to protect the life of Devaki. But Kamsa is not convinced by any of Vasudeva's preaching. Vasudeva tries to preach philosophy, such as what we learned in chapter 2 of Bhagavad Gita, the difference between the body and the soul the difference between what is material and spiritual, the difference between what is eternal and what is temporary. But Kamsa is not interested in Vasudev's philosophy. 
So Vasudev then comes up with a new plan. Vasudev says to Kamsa, Okay, right now Devaki has no children. So I promise you, Kamsa, that any child, not just the eighth child, any child that Devaki gives birth to, I will turn that child over to you and you can do with the child whatever you want. So this is when Kamsa says, all right. Now Kamsa could accept this promise of Vasudev because Vasudev is not a demon. If a demon makes a promise, he can easily break that because he's a demon. He has no morals. He has no scruples. So if, a, if Vasudev was a demon, then Kamsa would know, I can't trust him. But because Vasudev is a devotee, Kamsa knows, no, Vasudev is a devotee. And for a devotee, his word, his promise is most important. So because of Vasudev's promise, Kamsa says, yes, I will spare the life of Devaki. And as you say, if she gives birth, you give me that child. So now we come to the next scene. Bhagavatam can be broken out into different scenes, just like a movie. In a movie, there are different scenes. So now we are in Mathura. Vasudev and Devaki are living in their home. Kamsa is in his court. And one day, the great saint Narada Muni comes to visit Kamsa. Now, Narada Muni is such a personality that he is able to travel anywhere in the universe and he is equally accepted. He's accepted by the demons. He's accepted by the demigods on earth. Wherever Narada travels, everyone accepts Narada because he's a transcendental spaceman. He can travel all over the universe. He has mystic powers and he has that instrument, that special tambura, vina, by which he is his constant companion because that instrument, vina, whenever he strokes the strings, it makes the sound, radhika ramana, Radhika Ramana, Radhika Ramana, special instrument. Some say it was given to him by Krishna, and some say it was given to him by Sarasvati. In either case, it is a transcendental instrument. So Kamsa very nicely accepts Narada into his court. And Narada says to Kamsa, Oh, Kamsa, you're not aware of it, but Kamsa, I am Trikalagya. I can see past, present, I can see future also. Kamsa, do you know that in your previous birth, you were also a demon, and your name was Kalanemi, and there was a battle between the demigods and demons and you were killed by Lord Vishnu in your previous birth. But Kamsa, I'm here to inform you that Vishnu is coming once again to kill you. So Narada is confirming what the omen said because Krishna is the original Vishnu. Krishna is the original Narayana. So Narada frankly told Kamsa, yes, that Vishnu is going to come and kill you once again. Then Narada tells Kamsa, you know, Kamsa, that omen that said it would be the eighth child, you know what? I wouldn't trust that because any of Devaki's children might be the one to kill you. So that sets up a whole chain reaction. 
That sets up a whole chain reaction because now he's convinced by Narada not to be afraid of just the eighth child, but any child of Devaki could be the one. So, previous to Narada coming, Devaki had given birth to her first child, whose name was Kirtiman. And Kamsa, at that time, told Vasudev, well, this is Devaki's first child. I'm only worried about the eighth child. So you can take this child back. So Vasudev and Devaki were very, very happy that, oh, we at least get to keep this first son. But now that Narada has stirred the pot, and now that Narada is telling Kamsa, well, you know what? Any of the children of Devaki might be the one. Kamsa takes that first child and kills it. And Devaki gave birth to five more children, five more sons. And each time Vasudev turned over the child and Kamsa killed. So Devaki's first six children were all killed by Kamsa. Now, meanwhile, in the spiritual world, Krishna is speaking to his spiritual potency, Yogamaya. And Krishna tells Yogamaya in the spiritual world that my dear potency, my dear spiritual potency, right now in Devaki's womb is my expansion, Sankarsana, or Balaram. He is my first expansion. And I want you to attract Devaki's seventh child in her womb and attract him to go into the womb of another one of Vasudev's wives known as Rohini because Vasudev had married all of Devaki's sisters and he also married this girl, Rohini. But Rohini is living in Vrindavan under the care of Vasudev's friend, Nanda Maharaj. So Krishna tells Yogamaya, you can easily do this. Attract Sankarshan from the womb of Devaki into the womb of Rohini. So therefore, Balaram has two names. He has many names. But Balaram is known as the son of Devaki, Devaki Nandana, because originally he was in her womb. But Balaram is also known as Rohini Nandana because he actually appeared and took birth from the womb of Rohini. So Yogamaya does this. Remember, Yogamaya is the spiritual potency. So it appeared to everyone that uh, Devaki had a miscarriage. But what actually happened was that Sankarsana was attracted from uh, Devaki's womb into the womb of Rohini. So, during this time, Kamsa can do nothing but think of Krishna. Ever since he heard the omen, and now especially after Narada's appearance and what Narada told him, Kamsa can do nothing but think of Krishna. But unfortunately, he is thinking of Krishna unfavorably. So Kamsa is not a devotee. We learned in Bhagavad Gita when Krishna twice said that you should think of me, you should become my devotee. Manmana bhava mad bhakta. Twice Krishna said that in our Bhagavad Gita study. So anyone who thinks of Krishna is a devotee, but the devotee thinks of Krishna favorably, lovingly. Kamsa, however, 
is thinking of Krishna out of fear, out of hatred. So although he's always thinking of Krishna, it's unfavorably Krishna conscious. Now after this, after Sankarshan or Balaram is transferred from the womb of Devaki to the womb of Rohini, now Krishna appears in the womb of Devaki. And what happened? This is the next scene. The next scene is that Vasudev, oh, I forgot to mention that after Narada appeared and informed Kamsa, Vasudev and Devaki were then imprisoned by Kamsa. So they are shackled in iron chains after that incident with Narada. So Vasudev is uh, meditating and while he is meditating, Krishna appears in his heart and by yogic meditation, Krishna is transferred from Vasudev's heart into the womb of Devaki. And at this time, when Devaki is bearing Krishna in her womb, Devaki is looking un... <coughs> she is looking so effulgent because she is carrying Krishna in her womb. She is appearing so, so brilliantly, so illuminating. Everyone can see it. She has this special glow. Now Kamsa is worried because he's thinking, oh, if I kill Deviki now, it won't look good politically. The people will chastise me. The people will revolt. And not only is Devaki a woman, because in Vedic culture, you never kill a woman. That's considered very, very abominable to kill a woman. What to speak that it was his sister, Devaki, and now that she's pregnant, to kill her now would be an abomination. He would lose all credibility in the kingdom. So Kamsa is now in great, great anxiety because this is going to be the child. This is going to be the one that was predicted by the omen. So he's in great anxiety. His plan is as soon as Devaki gives birth, he will kill the child. He's just waiting. As soon as the child appears, Kamsa will kill the child. So as Devaki is pregnant with Krishna in her womb, the demigods invisibly appear to Devaki and offer her prayers. But they're not actually offering her prayers. They're actually praying to Krishna in the womb of Devaki. But they're appearing invisibly. She can see, but nobody else can see. So the demigods offer a stream of great philosophical prayers uh, glorifying the appearance of Krishna and what it will mean to the whole universe. And they're offering beautiful prayers and they're telling Devaki not to worry. There's nothing to worry about. You will be protected because you're carrying Krishna in your womb. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So I'm going to end here and we will pick up from this point in our next class. Now we can have questions. <laughs>